In 1920s birth, one of the most iconic and celebrated feminine heroes of all time, the Flapper. As the 20s roared, the women rebelled against the shackles of the past and they danced, drank, and dared to be something more than what their mothers ever aspired. But they still lacked an absolutely fundamental aspect of their freedom, the control over their own childbearing reproduction. But one woman began a movement that became a revolution to secure the right to birth control. But what what gave women in the 20s the confidence to challenge the past? Well, that's the treasure we're out to discover. I'm Dan Luer, and this is History for Humans. This is a picture of Margaret Sanger moments before she was set to deliver a speech on birth control in Boston. Threatened with arrest for doing so, she staged a theatrical protest instead. If you look closely, there's a smirk behind that gag. A proud rebel woman, Sanger was the mother of the birth control movement in America when it was not only unpopular but also criminal. She represented a rather extreme example of the rebellious 20s woman and was not without controversy in her day nor ours. So our exploration question for today's story lecture is, how did women's roles transform in the 1920s? And how did the birth control movement seek to liberate women? So use that as a frame to organize your thoughts as we go through today's rather heavy episode. And with that, we're off to the past. The most visible and culturally iconic symbol of the Roaring Twenties was without a doubt the flapper. She epitomized the new woman and the fun-loving, devil-may-care mentality of the Twenties. And to really recognize the radicalness of the flapper, we need to take a look at the ideal woman of the previous eras. The Gibson girl was the predecessor to the flapper, who herself was a more liberated woman than the Victorian ideal of the late 19th century. The Gibson girl though still represented a classical feminine beauty in both body and spirit. Though more athletic than the Victorian woman who preceded her, she was still a fragile lady with a long dress, corset, long flowing hair, and respectable and modest in manner. Against this, the flapper burst the classical bubble of womanhood. Her dress was shorter, showing legs and knees. She dropped the petticoats and discarded the corset. Her sleeves were shortened or vanished altogether, and she bobbed her hair, which was a truly radical statement. These changes in dress were not so much for sex appeal and style as much as they were for comfort and freedom. The flapper dressed so she could easily move, dance, and live freely. And more radical than the dress was their attitude, which was anything but quiet, bashful, and respectable. They drank and smoked publicly and danced and wore lipstick and cosmetics. Unburdened by the confines of the past, they dashed around in automobiles, frequented speakeasies, and danced the Charleston until their feet were sore and mothers were angry. But still yet, access or even knowledge of birth control was unheard of at this time. But into this frontier, one woman was about to send even greater shockwaves into American culture. Margaret Sanger was born in 1879 and was one of 11 children in an impoverished Irish-American family. Her devout Catholic mother died at just 49 after 18 pregnancies. Wait, I must have read that wrong. Nope. 18 pregnancies. Margaret Sanger was greatly impacted by seeing what became of her mother, and she became a nurse, serving other poor immigrant families across New York City. In and out of the worst crime-infested and disease-written slums, she witnessed many premature deaths of children and mothers alike. And this is gonna get heavy here, so bear with me. Her worst memories were seeing women suffering from illegal and often self-induced abortions. And after witnessing one of these, she decided she would devote her life to ensuring that the working women in America had knowledge of birth control methods and contraceptives that were illegal in the country. So in 1911, she began writing a column on female sexuality, speaking frankly about the need for birth control. Being able to control and limit the number of their pregnancies, Sanger felt, was the single most important remedy for generational poverty because it would keep women healthy and better able to perform their duties as mothers. But distribution of her pamphlet, The Rebel Woman, was banned by the post office for violating Comstock laws. The Comstock Act made it illegal to distribute any information about birth control through the mail or across state lines for being illicit and obscene. Undaunted, she then opened America's first birth control clinic in Brooklyn in 1916, offering family planning to women in need. 
But after nine days of operation, Sanger was arrested for violating Comstock laws. She was then released on bail, returned to her shop, where she was arrested again for operating a public nuisance, and this time was held for 30 days. But she fought on and appealed her case, and during the appeal, the judge ruled that doctors can actually prescribe birth control to married women for medical reasons. This was the first of many victories that Sanger and the birth control movement would have, and it was absolutely groundbreaking for women in America who were experiencing many other changes during the Jazz Age. With a booming economy, throughout the decade, no group benefited more than women who entered the workforce in large numbers. In the 20s, more women, both married and single, entered the workforce. You see, a job and a paycheck was a path to independence that many more women were demanding. However, they were still mostly confined to work as domestic servants, clerical workers, and in textile factories, jobs that were traditionally for women. And domestic women at home also experienced some massive transformations. With labor-saving devices like the washing machine, the refrigerator, and the vacuum cleaner, life became much less burdensome at home, and this liberated many women from non-stop household work, which allowed even more of them to then enter the workforce, even if it was just part-time. Another change happened in politics, because after receiving the right to vote, feminist groups in the 1920s split. Should they emphasize their difference for men to ensure workplace protections for women, or push for total equality with men? The divide was best displayed over the fight on the Equal Rights Amendment. More radical feminists like Alice Paul led the campaign for the ERA that would constitutionally guarantee equal protection under the law and prohibit any discrimination based on sex. But since this would have done away with all the workplace protections that women benefited from, it divided feminists. And due to this and the fact that many men were also opposed to it, the Equal Rights Amendment failed to pass. But in the area most important for women, their own bodies, Margaret Sanger began to fight even more fiercely as the 20s roared on. After her birth control clinic was shut down in 1919, she founded the American Birth Control League in 1921, now that doctors could prescribe contraception for medical reasons. Her clinic later became Planned Parenthood, the largest international group devoted to providing sexual health care in the world. Sanger staffed it with all female doctors and social workers. She also opened a clinic in Harlem run by an all-black advisory council and later an all-black staff as well. And we're gonna be coming back to this and the controversy surrounding it in just a minute. Sanger took the fight all over the country, going on lecture tours, promoting the need for women to control their own bodies. As she stated, no woman can call herself free who does not own and control her own body. No woman can call herself free until she can choose consciously whether she will or will not be a mother. And with her work focused on family planning and birth control, she was also involved in the eugenics movement. The eugenics movement was frighteningly popular at the time with both liberals and conservatives in the early 20th century. Eugenics promoted selective breeding to better the human race by limiting the reproduction of those with bad genes. And those seen as having the best traits by eugenicists were, you guessed it, white Anglo-Saxons. Now, Hitler and the Nazis took these beliefs to their most horrific ends, but this was in no way what most eugenics supported and definitely not what Sanger had in mind. And Sanger was a vocal opponent of the Nazis and they surely would have hated her for her beliefs. Still yet, she did work with the eugenics movement and she said some pretty terrible things at eugenics conferences, like using birth control to administer, the breeding out of the unfit, and of preventing the birth of defectives. Yikes. And Sanger today has also been criticized for promoting birth control and starting Planned Parenthood really as a means to control and limit the population of African Americans especially and other immigrant groups as well. But this really flies in the face of the facts that she worked tirelessly for white women's access to birth control throughout her life and that she was supported and worked with many black leaders during her lifetime. But either way, we are not here to simply celebrate her or to cancel her. As we study the past, we must be careful careful to realize that even some heroes of history had massive flaws and they lived amongst the circumstances of their time. And if we cancel those that we disagree with, then we can't grapple with their legacies or learn from their shortcomings. So Sanger continued to fight for women's access to birth control until her dying days. Her efforts continued to broaden the ability for doctors to prescribe contraception to women. She helped to fund research on affordable and effective oral contraceptives that was finally approved by the FDA 
in 1960, which we know today as the pill. And finally, the year before her death in 1965, the Supreme Court legalized access to birth control in America in the case Griswold versus Connecticut, right as a new movement of feminism was about to take the country by storm and who were much more daring than the Flappers or Sanger, but whose shoulders they definitely stood upon. So thanks for taking some time to engage in history today. This has been History for Humans. And hey, thank you so much for watching this heavy episode. It was actually really hard for me to navigate all of that. But if you enjoyed it and learned something along the way, could you click the thumb that looks like this and you can hit subscribe and get notices and notifications on when we're dropping new episodes. And for teachers and homeschool parents, you can head over to my website, historyforhumans.com and get access to lessons and resources that go with all of my episodes. And if you're doing the learning activity that's found on my website, hang out because I got instructions in just a sec. All right, guys, I love this lesson and I hope you will too. What you're first gonna be doing is analyzing photographs and images of flappers to compare them to the Gibson girl who was the predecessor to the 20s flapper. You're gonna make observations about their dress and their appearance and what's gonna be more challenging that you have to dig a little deeper is their attitudes and their character. There are gonna be some critical thinking questions that you're gonna answer and then you're gonna be reading a primary source written by a young flapper addressed to the older generation. It's style is so unique that you really get a feel for how flappers and the youth of about 100 years ago felt and how they saw the world. I think you're going to see some of yourself and your own generation in her. And then you're going to answer the questions that go with that reading. So read carefully, consider mightily, and answer bravely. Act like astronauts on this one and rock it.